and we have somebody that God has prepared over the years academically in terms of ministry to help us appreciate um, the topic. I'm going to try to introduce a person who does not need any kind of introduction. Um, this man for several years, over 25 years, has been leading uh, the church's social justice efforts in Ghana. Um, he has served as the managing director of Village of Hope since its inception in 1994. And through his leadership, his passion and vision for the children of Ghana and the children in God's kingdom, Village of Hope has grown and continues to grow in the midst of great um, challenges. Our resource person is not only um, a social justice advocate, he, he is first and foremost a preacher and a minister of, of uh, Brotherhood in Ghana. In terms of education, he has a BSc in Business Administration from the University of Ghana. So UG, if you don't know that he's your alum, now you know. Um, so go and, and tackle him. <laughs> um, and beyond that, he's also my senior at ACU. He holds an MA in Christian Ministry, an MA in Theology and History, both from um, Abilene Christian University. We are both wild cards in Ghana. And in 2021, he was named the ACU Outstanding Aluminous of the Year. Not so many people read your feet. Let's give it up to him. And he was also conferred with an honorary doctorate from the University of Professional Studies, Accra, UPSA, not I'm sure by now you have a sense of the person we are privileged to hear from this morning. He is no other person than Mr. Fred Wedu Asari. With a round of applause, let's Good morning. I'm told I'm wired up. Can you hear me? Maybe you need to switch it on. Hold on. It's on. It's on here, so. There is. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? No, you can't. Does this work? Yes. Uh, please, let me go my traditional way. This thing, it may give me an electrical shock, so... Uh, let's put it somewhere. Aha! Uh -huh. They say I'm not powerful enough, so they have to wire me up to be powerful. So they put this one on my chest, they put something on my waist, now they put this one here, so that they can wire me up to be powerful. So, good morning once again. I hope you can hear me. Praise the Lord. Still in an effort to make me more powerful. Yes, madam. I have been given instructions as to how to be more powerful. It's a joy to be here this morning. I'm greatly honored to be invited to participate in this year's TSC. And I want to thank the organizers for this invitation. To organize students from various universities is not easy. And so we must applaud our organizers for the work they have done in bringing all of us together. Let's, let's applaud them. And I want to thank them for asking me to speak. And for all those people who have been working behind the scenes so we can have places to sleep, food to eat, water, and of course, this place to gather and to study and to have fellowship. Thank you, you have done a great job. And uh, 
think that we have to commend our resource persons who are helping us uh, in this conference. I am exceptionally grateful that Professor Frank Gerton is here, coming all the way from the United States to be with us. Let us show our appreciation to the professor. And for his lecture, that says us ruling. Um, those of you who've seen my script, you see that I've quoted him um, because he says the ball rolling for all of us. It's good to see some alumni of the various universities here. Um, I'm exceptionally happy that I have seen Mr. Samuel Ayim here. Uh, he started it all at the University of Ghana. When he went to the University of Ghana, there was nothing like Church of Christ meeting over there. And then he took a paper and he wrote on it and pasted it on the various halls of residence. If you attend Church of Christ, write your name on this one. He pasted it everywhere. And then after a week or two, he went back and collected all of them and then start, started going from room to room looking for people. At the end of the day, he got about 10 people to get started with. Nine men and one woman, can you imagine? And all the men came to church trying to get the attention of that one woman. At the end of the day, one succeeded anyway. <laughs> and today, you go to Legon and there are so many people gathering there and all over the campuses. And it's good to have Mr. Samuel Ayim here. He's a pioneer in this. I can see Mr. Conrad Kakraba also here. And I see some other alumni who are here. It's wonderful. And for all of us participants to come from various places, including even those from UCC, you could have been elsewhere. You could have spent your holiday doing something else and you have chosen to be here. This is a choice you have made to be here, and I think that you have to commend yourselves and you have to be commended for this. Let's put our hands together for everybody <laughs> attending this year's TSC. What I like about being here is that I've been given time to talk. I like to talk. And so, when I've been given ample time to talk, it makes me very, very happy. I hope nobody will be holding a sign out there to say five minutes more and stop speaking. I went to a place I was speaking and they said, uh, uh, five minutes more, your time is up, please stop. And I told them, look, this is my last chance. I will say it, if you like, don't invite me again. <laughs> But today we will not go over time because I've been given ample time, ample time to speak. I am grateful for that. The topic is the impact of secularism and secularization on Christianity in Africa. The impact of secularism and secularization on Christianity in Africa. And since it is talking about Christianity in Africa, I think we should start from Africa. And let's look at the world view of Africans, African world view. It will be a good place to start as we delve into this all important topic. It is an undeniable fact that the African world view is essentially and intrinsically religious. From the cradle to the grave, Africans live under a canopy of religion. Africans are very religious people, and that shapes our worldview. And so you perhaps have heard of the Akan proverb that says, Obinche Abofra Nyame, which is literally meaning no one teaches a child about God. Once the child is born, the African believes that spirituality is inbuilt in that child. And so that child doesn't need somebody to teach him or her about God. We Africans believe that there is a spiritual dimension to most things, if not all things, in life. 
Everything that happens doesn't happen by chance. There's nothing like, oh, it happened by chance. That's not in the African worldview. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. And there are supernatural forces. Forces we cannot see. Unseen forces behind the things that happen. And so how many times have you not heard that during Christmas season, when there are so many road accidents and so many people die, there are some spirits behind that. When the devil wants to drink some milk of blood, then it causes accidents and blood is spilled. And these are the works of evil forces. It's not mechanical force of the vehicle. It's not driver mistake. It is caused by evil forces. That's how Africans think. That's how Africans behave or believe. And so the weather pattern, whether it rains or not, the yields of our farms, whether it's, uh, we have a good harvest or not, the prosperity of our businesses are all linked to spiritual forces. So if everybody is selling and you sell and you make a loss, check your family line. There must be something there that is making you make a loss. You just don't make a business, any, a business profit anyhow. We link everything to the spiritual. And especially when disaster strikes or when calamities occur, certainly there must be something spiritual about that. And so when somebody dies, the American will say, what killed him? What killed him? Is it cancer? Is it what? The African will say, who killed him? <laughs> who, who, who killed him? Ah, how can he die so young? No, 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 no. There is something inside. Have you not heard that before? Yeah. Yes! So that doesn't just happen. There are some spiritual forces. Somebody is behind the death. And so, everything is spiritualized. Even the success or failure of our soccer or football team. You know that? Yes. Ah, there you go. That's the proper way. So it's not that the team just lost. There are some forces. When the player was going to score the goal, he saw something like a lion in the goalpost. And so he couldn't. Oh, you haven't heard of the boxer who lost the fight? Because when he was boxing, he was seeing a bear. He was fighting with a bear. And so he couldn't punch. And that's why he lost the boxing match. And when our team loses, it is because the other people have gone for juju, ways, and means. So when we, when should we go to the farm? There must be a spiritual means to that. So we don't go to the farm on Thursday because, as I say, the farm, the, the goddess of the land, Thursday is her day. So you don't go too far. We don't go to the sea. Those of us by the coast. We don't go to the sea on Tuesday. We don't go to the sea on Tuesday. Not so that the fish will rest and reproduce. No. Not so that the fish stock doesn't get depleted. No. Not so that we can rest. No. We don't go because the God of the sea doesn't want to be disturbed on that day. So that's why we don't go to the sea on such days. When you are going to fetch water, from the river before Ghana water started producing highborn water. Every morning, children and especially mothers would go to the riverside and to fetch water. And you are told, you don't step in there with your shoes or with your bathroom slippers. You have to go barefooted. Not because you pollute the water, but because the sea, the river, God doesn't want shoes. And you dare not spit into the water. You will get so truth for one year. Because <laughs> that's an insult. You are spitting on the God. Not just because there is a community downstream that if you spit in the water, you pollute the water for that community. No, it's because the God of the river doesn't want you to spit. Who, who 
wants anybody to speak to him or her. It's the same with the world. So everything is spiritualized. And it is this African penchant for spirituality or spiritualizing everything that led John in Betty, a noted African theologian, to describe Africans as notoriously religious. Notoriously religious. And scholars, including in Betty and others, in Betty and others, have described the African as incurably religious. You cannot cure the African of religion because when he was born, religion was inside him. It was inbuilt in him. So everything about African worldview is viewed in the sense of the spiritual, in the sense of religion. The Europeans did not teach Africans about God. Africans knew God long before the advent of Europeans on the African soil. Look at the names that African gives to God. This name did originate from Europe or from outside the continent. Whether it's Igbo or Yoruba or Ewe or Akan. Whether it's Swahili or Kiswahili or any other language. Our names for God have meaning. The fantasy Nyankupon. What is it? Nyankupon, Nyankupon friend. Pon great. God is a great friend. So when you say Onyankupon, you are saying that your God is a great friend. Nyankupon. Nyame. Nyame. When you have God, you are satisfied. You don't need anything in life. Nyame. The one who satisfies you, so you don't need anything else. Or trade yampo. This is an reference to God. Or trade yampo. God is a mighty tree. When you lean against that tree, you will never slip and fall down. That is God for the African. Ototrobonsu, the one who gives the rain, who gives the water. And so these names that Africans have of God show you that they knew God before any foreigner came to the African continent. Africans are indeed incredibly religious. But before Christianity came to Africa, the Africans believed in God and they worshipped God. They worshipped God through their ancestors. They worshipped God through other lesser deities. But Africans believed in an almighty God. Nobody came to teach Africans the almighty God. Africans believed in an almighty God. But God was so mighty that you could not approach him directly. You had to approach him through lesser gods. And Christianity came and said, no, you approach God through the Son, Jesus Christ. By the same God. Just that now we know the way to that God. And it's not true things that have been made with the hands of men. Idols that have been carved by carvers. Hewn out of stones. But we serve the living God through his son. And so, when the Western Europeans landed on the shores of West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, they came to show the African how to approach this almighty God through his beloved son, Jesus Christ. But even before then, Christianity had come into Africa long ago. In fact, in the New Testament book of Acts, 
We read that Christianity began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Not too long afterwards, an Ethiopian who had gone to worship God from afar, he could not enter, but he could stand afar and worship. And I wonder why he had to travel so many miles not to enter. Because when you are a foreigner, you are a Gentile, you are not a Jew, you cannot approach God up close and personal. Two, you are Nino. You cannot. So he came to worship God in Jerusalem, but he will still worship God from afar. And on his way back, God converted. The Ethiopian Nino went back home rejoicing. What did he send back? He sent back his new faith. And historically, it can be proven without a shadow of a doubt that Christianity has had a presence in Ethiopia since then. And during the early centuries of Christianity, Africa was a strong hold of Christianity, especially North Africa, where cities like Alexandria became powerhouses of the Christian faith, producing Christian scholars and doctors for the church. So Christianity has always been in Africa from the very beginning. But it stayed mainly in the northern part of Africa. Until the Europeans came on our shores and brought Catholicism and the major European Protestant churches. The Portuguese were Catholics when they came to the Almina castle. And then the Dutch were Protestants. And when the Dutch took over the castle, they converted the Portuguese Catholic Church into a slave market. And then they built their own Dutch Reformed Church on top of the slave, the male slave dungeon. And said God was up there. But down there where the slaves were, God was not there. So they worshiped God up there and beneath them were the slaves. And they brought Christianity that has spread. Spread all over the African continent. But then, some Africans taking the Bible, reading the Bible, and taking off from where the African, the Europeans left on, also started independent African churches. What sometimes we call spiritual churches. These are independent indigenous African churches that spread widely on the continent from east to west and have made thousands if not millions of converts. Then came charismatism and Pentecostalism and that is now spreading like a bushfire in the dry Hamatan season in northern Ghana. It's spreading everywhere. And so Africa has become more or less a Christianized continent. And I dare say that if it has not already happened, very soon there will be more Christians in Africa than any other continent of the world. There will be more Christians in Africa than any other continent of the world. Because whereas European, Europe, Europe has become post-Christian and America is turning into post-Christian dumb. Christianity is growing and flourishing in Africa. When it comes to the churches of Christ, the churches of Christ's presence in Africa started with a man called John Sheriff who moved from Australia to South Africa. He's the first known Church of Christ member or preacher or minister or missionary to enter the African continent. Others followed. William Sh that, For Sheriff, it was in 1897. But others like William Short followed in 1921. George Scott followed in 1926. Do Merritt in 1926. Six, Leslie Brown in 1929, A.B. Reese in 1929, S.D. Garrett in 1930. 
and most of these people were in southern Africa that's where they went in southern Africa how did the Church of Christ get to West Africa through a man called C A O S E N from Nigeria Asian was a police officer he had correspondence course with some Church of Christ people in the United States and as he received the material and studied it he realized that he needed to become a New Testament Christian and after doing that he went around teaching the courses he had received the material he had received he went around teaching preaching converting people then he went to the Americans and said look I have started over 100 churches I have baptized thousands of people I need huge people to come and help and they said how? how can one person within a short space of time plant over 100 churches and baptize thousands of people so they sent word to southern Africa to the missionaries there that they should go to Nigeria and go and check on this story that they are hearing in those days there were no emails there were no Facebook and there was no social media it was letter writing by snail mail so two missionaries from southern Africa went to Nigeria to check and they wrote back to the America and said it is true there are hundreds of churches of Christ in Nigeria thousands of converts all through the work of CAOSDM so you better send missionaries to come and help them and teach them the more perfect way that is how American missionaries go to Nigeria. When they went there, the church was already established. And then, another man in Ghana called John Opon Gedu was in Inkum in the central region. And he also was corresponding with an American from Alabama. And through the Bible correspondence course, he said, I want to study further. The nearest Church of Christ missionary was in Eastern Nigeria. And so, this man in Alabama sent a letter, wrote a letter to the missionaries in Eastern Nigeria. Now, there's somebody in Ghana who wants to study the Bible further. Can you go and support or help the person? And then the missionaries wrote back to the man and said, we can go, but we need $200 for our expenses. Because we don't have money. We are struggling to be here. And the little money we have to spend here, we cannot use that money to travel from Nigeria, Eastern Nigeria, to Western Nigeria, to Dahomey, to Trans-Togoland, and to Gold Coast. We can't do that. So we need some help and we will go. When his letter got there, he read the letter, says they needed $200 to go to Ghana. Then he read another letter from Spain. There was an American military base in Spain. And the Church of Christ military members, when they go to the, they are posted to that military base, they will meet for worship. And then they will, as part of worship, do giving, collection. But they were military people, they didn't need the money. And then after a while they are posted out. So they have gathered some money from their collection. They didn't know what to do. So they sent it to this man in Alabama and said, here is some money from our church worship services. Use it for some good. So he opened the thing, he got $200. And then the letter from Nigeria said, we need $200. So he took the money from Spain and sent it to Nigeria. That's how the gospel came to Ghana. From America through Spain to Nigeria or whatever it is. And so they got the money and then they traveled through Benin, which is was Dahomey, through Togo and into Ghana. And came to meet this John Opongedu. They studied with him around June, July of 1958 and went back to Nigeria. In November 58, they came back, and they came with some Nigerian evangelists, and they stayed this summer with him, and he was baptized in November of 1958. Then the missionaries returned. Upon Gedu, with his own money, traveled to Nigeria two times to go and study more, because he wanted to understand. 
And then he came back to Ghana and planted about four churches in the Inkum Suedro area. The Nigerian missionaries, knowing American missionaries in Nigeria, knowing they couldn't come to Ghana often, sent word to America, encouraging any young people who were interested to come to Ghana as resident missionaries. Two men, Jerry Reynolds and David Davenport, heeded the call that they would come to Ghana as missionaries. So they and their families traveled to Ghana in 1961. They had made plans that they would meet with or in, in um, Gaidu, meet with Gaidu, and then they would then grow the Church of Christ. But they got to Ghana in October of 1961. Gaidu died in July of 1961, so they never met. But on their way, they stopped in Nigeria to check, to get advice from the missionaries in Nigeria how to do mission work in Ghana. When they got there, they met a man called Samuel Boy Obey, who had been converted in Ghana and was studying in Nigeria, the Bible school there. And Obi told them, I'm coming to Ghana in December after graduation. And when I come, I'll be in the Kumasi area. So you can go to, and start in Kumasi and I'll come and join you. Originally, they were going to Inkum or Swedru, but Gedu was there. They didn't know anybody in Ghana. Kumasi was the second largest city, so they decided to settle in Kumasi and not Accra, the capital city. So they, set, they got there in October. In December, Samuel Obey joined them, and then from there, the next year, 1962, they started the Ghana Bible College, the first school of preaching, or seminary of Churches of Christ, and the church grew from there. That is how Christianity came to Africa, came to West Africa, and how the Church of Christ got to Ghana. What you have to understand is that when the Churches of Christ began in Ghana, there was an understanding that Christianity was all of your life. In those days, the understanding was that Christianity was your whole life. And so you don't separate your life into compartments. Everything about your life matters. And so one was expected to exhibit the Christian faith in all aspects of their life. At home, at work, at the marketplace, in school, and indeed everywhere one finds himself or herself. And so the churches of Christ were very strict in making sure that whatever you do at home and at school and at work and at the marketplace were the same. And it must exhibit Christ. You don't separate the two. And so in the churches of Christ in the beginning, issues with neighbors were brought before church leaders for resolution. If you live in a house, a compound house with other households, and your neighbor had an issue with you, you come to the church. And the church leaders will call you and settle the matter. In fact, Christian employers, when their employees had complaints about them, the church leaders will call the employer and call the employee and settle the matter. So you may be a business owner. The church didn't give you money to establish the business. You raise your own money and through your entrepreneurial skills and acumen, you start your own business. You employ people who may or may not be members of the church. When they have a problem uh, about your work or how you treat them, they will go and tell the church leaders. And the church leaders will have the audacity to call you and say, brother, come, sit down. Your workers are saying you are not treating them well. Or your workers say this and this. And they will settle the matter. And you dare not say, how dare you? This is my private business. This is not church business. The church didn't give me capital to start. No, 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 no. Once you're a church member, your whole life, whether as an employer or an employee, must be governed by Christ. So there are cases that were settled between employers and employees by church members or church leaders. And the employers did not complain. 
because they saw themselves as Christians and they believed that every aspect of their life was regulated by Christ. And so in the early days, church leaders will go to the homes of young Christians and talk to the parents to find out the character and behavior of those Christians at home. I remember one Sunday, after worship service, I had gone home, I lived in Accra, Jolu. I was living with my aunt, my aunt and her husband. And there was a knock on our gate, Sunday afternoon. And then I went to open the gate only to see my church leaders from the Jolu Church of Christ. Hey, are you going to do evangelism somewhere? You wanted to say hello. I said, no, we came to your house. Ah, my house, yes. We want to see your mother, which is my aunt. Ah, okay. So I made them come inside. Then I went to tell my aunt that uh, some of my church leaders have come and they say they want to meet with you. So my aunt welcomed them to the sitting room, served them water. I sat down, she sat down, and she said, uh, yes, you are welcome. What can I do for you? And so your, your son, is, is a church member. And so, yeah, I know, Church of Christ, every Sunday he comes, even this morning he came to you and said, oh, yeah, yeah, yes. We want to ask you about his behavior at home. And you can imagine my heart was boom, 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 boom. If I were an older man, I would have had a heart attack. But in those days, my veins were young and my heart was strong. Hey! Without warning, without notice, church leaders, about seven of them in my empty sitting room asking about my behavior. Am I obedient? Am I respectful? Am I this? Hey! And I was not going for any position. They were not interviewing me. Maybe I want to be youth leader. So there's a vetting committee. No. Why? Because the church believed that a Christian must not have different standards. So they will come to your house and ask your parents about your behavior. Because that was what the church believed in. That there is no dichotomy between what is spiritual and what is secular. No. Your life was one. So you don't say this is my Christian life and this is my secular life. That was the foundation upon which the churches of Christ were established and grew rapidly in Ghana. So let's take some time and go back and refresh our memories of what we heard yesterday about what is secularism and what is secularization. I know that Professor Frank Newton has explained that thoroughly and how it has spread and its impact in the West. But let me also help the way I understand it. And this is my understanding. First, a visit to the Oxford Reference Dictionary, where the word secular is defined as concerned with the affairs of this world, not spiritual or sacred, not ecclesiastical or monastic. It defines secularism as the belief that morality or education should not be based on religion. And so, when we talk about something being secular, it is something that is concerned about the world not concerned about the spiritual world not concerned about what is sacred and when we are talking about secularism the Oxford dictionary says that it's a belief that morality or education should not be based on religion you separate religion from morality the american heritage college dictionary defines secular as worldly rather than spiritual not specifically relating to religion or to a religious body it defines secularism as religious skepticism or indifference, the view that religious considerations should be excluded from civil affairs or public education. Religious considerations should be excluded from civil affairs or public education. That same dictionary defines secularize as to transform from ecclesiastical or religious to civil or lay use or ownership, to draw away from religious orientation, to make worldly. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology explains secularism 
as a way of life and thought pursued without reference to God or religion. A way of life or thought pursued without reference to God or religion. So for example, when it comes to discussing human rights, such as the rights of same-sex relationships, have you realized that the argument doesn't mention religion? They don't say that our religion says this. The argument has been based on culture, tradition. But it doesn't talk about religion. Because your religion says that same-sex relationship is wrong. Somebody's religion says it's not wrong. So whose religion should we go by? And Ghana is a secular state. Ghana is not a theocracy. Ghana is not a religious state. It's a secular state. So when you come to arguing and discussing issues of same-sex marriage, you don't bring your religion inside. Keep it away. So people are now resorting to our way of life as Africans and not to our religion. And so that is why you don't see religion featuring in that discussion. Because we have to separate the affairs of state from the affairs of your faith. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology explains that secularization refers to the transfer of property from ecclesiastical jurisdiction to the state or non-ecclesiastical authority. In another sense, secularization has to do with shifting ways of thinking and living away from God towards this world. So when we talk about secularism, it seeks to draw a clear boundary or that separates that which is religious from that which is not. A boundary that separates that which is holy from that which is not. A boundary that se separates or divides private religious affairs from public civil affairs. You have your private religious affairs, your beliefs, keep them to yourself. Then there are the civil matters of state that is public. So you don't bring your private matter into the public space. You don't bring your religious matter into the civil space. And those two must not be mixed. And as Professor Frank Gilton taught us, to be secular is to be divided. Secularization then is a cultural climate of division. In the secular age, human beings are regularly being divided in what they believe, in how they belong, and in how they determine what is good." Unquote. My understanding of secularization is that it seeks to compartmentalize our lives into what is sacred and what is profane, into what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar. So you give to God what is God's, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So secularization then is saying that you don't combine your lives. It brings about division. has not been the understanding of Africans from the very beginning. Because in Africa, everything is religious. Everything is together. And so that's why in African society, whatever happens, the Africans seek to understand it from a spiritual point of view. And God is consulted constantly and that is why the fetish priest plays a significant integral part of community life in African communities. When they are going to war, they will consult the gods. Should we go or should we not go? When they are going to travel, they consult the gods. Should we travel or should we not travel? In matters of health, they consult the gods. This sickness, will it lead to death or what should I do? And the fetish priest will be called. When there is childbirth, the fetish priest is called. When there is death, the fetish So like the ancient Israelites, everything the African does, God is part of it. And you know Israel, when they are going to war, they ask God. You read in the Old Testament. When there is sickness, the, chief, the king will send, go to the prophet and ask, will I recover from this sickness? Or will I die? When there is a plague, they want to know, what have we done? 
That was the way Africans also taught. And when Christianity came to Africa, at least among the churches of Christ, the way we believed was that we don't separate our godly life from our secular life. We don't separate our spiritual life from our physical life. But secularization says you separate the two, you divide the two. And you don't mix the two up. So give to God what is God's. When you are done, now you can go and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And it's okay to live one way this way and live one way the other way. And so if you are a university student, on Sunday you go to God and offer him acceptable worship. Make sure you obey the five acts of worship. Religiously. Singing, praying, taking the Lord's Supper, hearing the sermon, giving, right? So if you have heard the word of God, you have believed, you have repented, you have confessed your faith in Christ, and you have been baptized, hallelujah, you have fulfilled the first five commandments of God. And then if on Sunday you sing, you hear the word of God, you pray, you give, and you take the Lord's Supper, then you have fulfilled all righteousness. Five plus five, ten. And so if you're a Christian university student and you go to church on Sunday and you offer acceptable worship to God on Sunday and God is very pleased with you. Now what you do at the Hall of Residence on Monday, it doesn't really matter. And what you do at lectures on Tuesday doesn't really matter. So long as you have given God his sacrifice, you are okay. Beloved, that is not what the scriptures teach. If your Christian life on Sunday is different from your student life on Tuesday, then you have been secularized. If the way you behave at the church fellowship is different from the way you behave at the hall fellowship with your non-church friends, then you have believed and bought into this lie of secularization. That is telling you that you must compartmentalize your life. Secularism has come to Africa and has gained a lot of grants. Africans who believe that everything is religious and therefore have showed unwavering faith in spite of being ostracized by their families, in spite of being cast away by their friends and their communities. Africans who have believed that they cannot mix Christianity with idol worship or with traditional African religion and so have bent their gods and their idols. Now, these same Africans are turning to new gods, not woven with the hands of men, not carved out of trees, but a new god nonetheless. And gradually, they are succumbing to the creeping influences of secularism and secularization. So, where have all these things come from? I will tell you a few of the sources of secularism in Africa. One is the influence of Western culture into the African continent. Yesterday we learned about how secularism has taken over the West and its impact. Well, one of the impacts of secularism in the West is that it has been exported to Africa and we have gradually taken it. And so, through the media, television, it started in the days before the internet, television, radio, 
And now, with the internet and with the electronic media, Western culture, Western belief systems have been imported into Africa. And so Western fashion styles have been unapologetically promoted, especially by commercial entities. And they've looked beautiful to Africans, and African Christians have taken them over. Globalization has made it very easy for Western beliefs and practices to be quickly decimated, decimated in Africa. In times past, if you wanted to bring a magazine that promoted, for example, pornography to Africa, you have to put it on a ship. It may take two months to enter to get to the port. If the custom officers see it, they will seize it. They will burn it. Unwanted material. If it is living, it gets through. Only a few people will get it. And then it will take years for it to be passed on and on and on. Today, you just click SSS, www.sss or something, or whatever it is, and you will what? You will get it right there on your phone. Your own cell phone, you will get it there. Right there on your laptop. Right there on your desktop. It's just accessible. When COVID-19 was attempting to come to Ghana, what did we do? Didn't you quarantine it at the airport? You travel and you come and say, you go and stay in this hotel for two weeks. After two weeks, if you are not sick, we will let you go. And by the way, the state will not pay you. You have to pay your hotel bill. We quarantine it at the airport. Hey, hey, hold on. Let's do a test to see if you have it. If you have it, we quarantine you and we send you back to your country, wherever you came from. If you're a Ghanaian, we'll keep you there for a while till you are well. But today, Western culture is not quarantined. Nobody says, hold on, let me check you before you enter. They enter. And walk about all over. And say hello to the young men and young women. There's no censorship. There's no censorship. And this is what has come into Africa. And unfortunately, many people do not have the training, do not have the wisdom and the discernment to know what is right and what is wrong. And many gullible African youth are being taken by this. What do we say? The best come from the West. This, I, I believe, came about during the Cold War. Everything is communist Russia. It's bad. It's not good. Inferior is a what? Inferior communist that is. Uh, communist inferior that is. Yes. So, even when you watch movies, you see that the communists are inferior. Their machinery, their everything is inferior. As against the Western machinery, Western guns. As against the Western way of things. They are communists, inferior that is. It's bad. But the best comes from the West. And we've walked into it. Now everything from the West is the best. So if it's the best, you don't question it. You just absorb it. And so if they tell you to separate your life, well, they must know. After all, they brought us the Bible, right? They brought us the Bible. They are saying that we should do this. Oh, it's okay. And because of this gradually, Western secularization and secularism has creeped into the African continent. Western education has been a major source of secularization in Africa. Western literacy and education were introduced centuries ago by Christian missionaries as a means of Christianizing the African continent. They believe that Christianity is a literary religion. The Christians are the people of the book. So to be a good Christian, you must be able to read the book, the Bible. And so Western missionaries started schools to educate Africans 
Not so they will become Harvard professors. Not so they will become engineers. No. Not that they will become scientists, but so they can become good Christians, proper Christians who can read the Bible. That is why most schools started in many African countries were started by missionaries. Well, we teach you to read and write so you can read the Bible and become a good Christian. Well, over the years, the focus has shifted. And now, political reasons have also been brought into education. And commercial purposes have also come into education. Because the European colonial powers needed educated Africans through whom they can rule. So, they encourage the literate to learn not just the Bible, but to learn about their politics, to learn about their system, and how good it is, and how bad the African system is. And then, they made them governors, they made them administrators, they made them regents, they made them leaders of the African people. And so through the educated, the colonial masters ruled the masses. And if you are educated, you have special privileges. You stayed in a government bungalow. You have a security man who is uneducated. You have a cook who is uneducated. You have a driver who is uneducated. And so it became a good thing to be educated. So you can get a job in the government system. So that the Europeans will rule over the Africans through that system of politics. Then commercial interest came in. How do we mine all the gold in Africa, the diamond? How, how do we get the resources? We need African engineers to go to the forest and cut down the timber and transport them to the port for us. So we have to educate them. We need African mine experts to go underground and bring the gold. So we have to educate them. And so, because of commercial interest, education was promoted. And if you are educated, you have authority, you have wealth, you have influence, and you enjoy the good things of life the goodies of life and so it became attractive education became attractive it became a status symbol that people crave for if you need a further education you have to go outside africa to get it and when you go and you come back with your euros or with your pound sterling or with your french franc or with your american dollar you are very powerful and these educated Africans come with their own lifestyle because they have been taught in the West. And they bring that lifestyle to Africa and it looks so nice, so enticing. And so young people want to be like that. And we copy blindly. And so the educated Africans have brought about an increase in secularism on the continent, which has had a firm grip on the African consciousness. Right now, no forest is sacred any longer. In the past, certain forests were sacred. You can't go to that forest. Not because the trees give us oxygen and serve as wind breaks, when it rains, so the village is not wiped out. No. Not because that is the source of the water that feeds the community. No. It is because it is a sacred forest. And the gods don't want us to enter. So Africans kept away. Now here comes the Europeanized African. The educated African. Who said, no, 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 no. And there's nothing sacred about the trees. Let's go, let's go, let's go, you see nobody will die. They are like, hey, we can't go. Get down, get down. Then the, his, the engineer jumps on the equipment and he goes in there, he bulldozes 10 trees and everybody is waiting for him to die. After 10 days, he's not dead. 
Now they think, oh, okay, we can also go. So what have we done? We've gathered all our timber. And where? Exported them. Exported the timber. Now there is no surface forest. So what have we done? We've depleted our forest cover. Now when it rains, no wind breaks, no wind shields. And our buildings are collapsing, the roofs are being torn away, we don't understand. This river used to be a sacred river. You don't pollute it. I've been educating myself, oh no, no, according to science, this is H2O. <laughs> Whatever that means. There's nothing about it. H is not a god, 2 is not a god, and O is not a goddess. So you can uh, do whatever you want. What has happened to our water bodies? They've all been polluted. All the water bodies. If we are not careful very soon, we'll be importing water. Because we pollute, because there's nothing sacred any longer. There's nothing to be afraid of any longer. And so that is what has happened. Western education has brought in secularism. And then comes democracy. In the past, everything was embodied in the king or the chief. He's the spiritual head, he's the physical head, he's the community head, he's the custodian of the land. Everything was embodied in him. Now we say, no, 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 no. We want to vote for our own leaders. And so we have put away our chiefs. We have put away our chiefs. We have put away our kings. And we have elected our own political leaders. And they tell us that politics is different from religion. And so you don't miss the two up. And so our lives have been compartmentalized. That is what has brought about the strengthening grips of secularism and secularization. We have managed to keep our faith and our politics apart such that the two have been divorced. They cannot be together and we keep them increasingly apart. And so now, secularism has permeated every fabric of life in Africa. Politics, governance, business, education, entertainment, culture, communal living, family living, and religion and faith. It's ascended everywhere. Like how you put yeast in a dough. You don't see it working, but it's working gradually, gradually, and before you realize, the whole dough has become leaven. That is how secularism is working. And the impact can be seen by all. Christians in Africa are becoming increasingly secularized. And unfortunately, as the society goes, so goes the church. That shouldn't be the case. But in reality, that is what is happening. That the church, which is supposed to be counter-cultural, has now assimilated culture, popular culture, social culture. And so instead of the opposite, the church influences society, now society is influencing the church. Many Christians live compartmentalized lives. Their lives at the workplace are completely different from their lives at church. And many see nothing wrong with it. Or at least, they don't feel guilty about it. As such, even though the number of Christians is growing rapidly in Africa, there is also an increasing decline of Christian influence on the continent. Look at the English-speaking countries of Africa. They are the ones that have been, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, are the ones that have been most Christianized because of language. Look at Ghana, Nigeria, Malawi, Zambia, 
Zimbabwe, South Africa. These are all English-speaking African countries, south of the Sahara. These are all heavily populated with Christians. These are the most Christianized countries in Africa. And these are the countries with the worst corruption. Have you wondered why? Why are the most Christianized African countries are the most corrupt? Because Western secularization has taught us to separate our Christian life from our other lives. That is the impact we are feeling now. And so, we claim to be Christians, but it is not evident in anything we do. It's not evident. Political power is often obtained to enrich oneself and to steal public or state funds for self, for family and friends, to the detriment of the rest of society who form the vast majority of people. Personal integrity is lost. This is the impact we are feeling now. A Christian brother narrated a very sad story to me. He owned a microfinance business, very successful microfinance business, doing very well. He decided after many years of working that he wants to take a break, just for one month, so he will visit Europe. He left his business in the charge of two faithful Church of Christ members, faithful Christians, one man, one woman. For just one month. This happened in the Ashanti region. I won't give further details. <laughs> After one month he re returned, the place was locked down. Come to find out, the sister had gone to Australia, the brother had gone to Germany. The two people. And they had emptied the bank account. Oh yes. <laughs> He had to sell his house in Accra to pay his depositors. He sold his house. He was almost crying when he was telling me this. He sold his house in Accra to pay the depositors. So he is not arrested and then collapsed the business. Why? Because he left it in the care of two faithful Christians. That is what secularization will do to you. Lack of personal integrity. So-called Christians steal funds from employers or state funds and are not afraid to bring that money and give it to God. They give it to God and they boast about it. Money that they have stolen, they come to church and they give that money and we praise them for that. These robbers they are not Christians. But why can they do that? Because they have fulfilled the requirements of the Lord. They have worshipped God. They have finished that part. So what they do on Thursday is stealing. It's okay. God doesn't, is not bothered by that. Today, the hardest thing for employers is to find an honest person to work with. I'm telling you, I'm an employer.
if we don't talk about it, it will be eating us away, eating away. But we, nobody will say anything. Until everything is lost. And so the fact that we are discussing this is very important. At least it exposes it for what it is. So that we are careful not to go to bed with it. Because it's a dangerous thing that can destroy us. But beyond discussing it, beyond our breakout sessions and our discussions, beyond the theories, there must be action. There should be deliberate, concerted effort to teach that the Christian life is not a divided life. Everybody must be taught and must be made to understand clearly, without any ambiguity, that the Christian life is not a divided life. If we don't understand this, we will live our Christian lives and live our other social lives and our secular lives and our educational lives and our professional lives. And it will not be to the glory of God. The Christian life is a life of total commitment to Christ. The realities of life must be faced with undivided commitment as disciples of Jesus who are willing to carry their cross and follow their master no matter the cost. If early Christians lost their lives pursuing faithfulness to Jesus Christ, then what are we doing? Even to this day, many followers of Christ have been persecuted. Go to Mauritania. Go to China. Go to Iran. Go to Pakistan. Go to so many other countries. Christians have been persecuted even in this 21st century world. And we are here with freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of movement, and nobody is persecuting us. And we are even proud to say we are Christians. And all God is asking from us is undivided commitment. And we say it's too much. Is that too much for God to ask from us when others are giving up their lives for the sake of Christ? It is not too much. To give up driving a flamboyant car to be a faithful Christian is not too much. But many young people want to drive a vehicle that the CEO is driving. It took him 25 years to drive that vehicle. You have started, you just finished your national service, but God's great, you have a job. You are aiming to buy that vehicle in two years. Hello. You are a suspect for thievery. You are about to commit stealing. The things we want in this life, for which we so easily compromise our Christian faith, is nothing compared to the sufferings and the sacrifices some people are, are going through, some Christians are going through in nations where they are persecuted. If we are to face this monster called secularism, then we must face it with holiness and purity of hearts, integrity of life, and total commitment to Christ. These are the things that must be emphasized as the great doctrines of the church. What is doctrine? Doctrine simply means teaching. And I expect that you who have been educated can understand this simple thing. The King James Version says they continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. The NIV says they continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Teaching. One plus one, put it together, you have passed mathematics. Doctrine and teaching are the same thing. But somehow we are majoring in controversial issues. And think of the doctrine of the church are the controversial issues. The ones we can debate other people about and put them in their rightful positions. And our focus is on that. And we have somehow forgotten or are attempting to forget 
That righteousness is a doctrine of the church. Love is a doctrine of the church. Joy is a doctrine of the church. Don't you know that peace, peace is a doctrine of the church? Forbearance is a doctrine of the church. Kindness is church doctrine. Goodness, faithfulness. All these are doctrines of the church. Integrity is a doctrine of the church. We should no longer lie to one another, but we should speak the truth one to another. Is that not in your Bible? Have you not been reading it? Let us understand, these are doctrines of the church that must be promoted. That must be emphasized. God hasn't changed his word. Pursue holiness without which no one. Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Education, Master's, MSc, um, MED, a Doctor of uh, Philosophy. Uh, doc- no one, no one will see the face of God without holiness. Are these the things you preach? Are these the things you cheat? Are these the things you are pursuing? Which is easier to say? Christians! Don't go by the Sabbath. The Sabbath is past. Christians are to worship God on the Lord's day. All those Sabbatarians are wrong. Those of us who worship on the Lord's day, we are right. Or to say, every Sunday, I fellowship with the church, no matter what. Rain or shine, I'm there. With or without an umbrella, I'm there. Even when I feel sick and weak, I am there. Even when I have a major exam on Monday, I am there because it is the Lord's day and I go to worship with fellow Christians which is easier you can shout hey the Lord's day is better than the Sabbath day the Lord's day is this Uh, do you worship on the Lord's day do you faithfully worship on the Lord's day which is easier to say that instrumental music is past you cannot worship God with instruments. It's a sin. Anyone who worship God with an instrument of music is wrong. Or to say, every time I worship my God, I sing from the bottom of my heart. My voice may not be the best. My voice may not be good. But I sing with my soul and with my spirit and with my body. I praise my Lord. Which one is easier? You are shouting instrumental music is wrong. Instrumental music is wrong. You go to church worship. You don't sing. Who are you? If it is wrong, prove that it is wrong by your singing. Some of you, I don't know whether we have to pay you to sing or what. You are too polished. Too polished. Too educated. To sing from your heart to the Lord. And yet you are the very people saying instrumental music is wrong. Which is easier? To say, tithing is wrong. Anyone who collects tithe is a swindler. It's wrong. God says Christians shouldn't pay tithes. Or to say, because I am a Christian, I give at least 15 to 20% of my income every month. Which is easier? You can shout at the top of the roof. Tithe is wrong. Tithe is wrong. Don't pay tithe. Then how much do you give to God? How much? You making math, 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 math. Tithe is wrong. You are saying that why? Because you don't want to give ten percent and more. <laughs> but no, 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 no. It's because the Bible says so. I'm a believer in the Bible. And then prove me wrong by giving twenty percent of your income. Haven't you read your own Bible? In the early church, what percentage were they giving? When Barnabas went to sell the land, what percentage did he give? Go and check what percentage the Macedonians gave. You are giving 2% of your income and you are shouting, Titan is wrong, Titan is wrong, Titan is wrong. Beloved, let us understand 
that we cannot ignore the doctrine of the church on holiness and purity. For what shall it profit a Christian if he wins the debate and loses the soul? Yeah, you've won the debate. You are right. But you didn't win anyone for Christ. Is that what you want? That you are winning debates all over the place? And you are not winning anyone for Christ? What will it profit a Christian if she teaches pure doctrine and lives but lives life without purity and holiness? Think about it. After the doctrine, it is pure. You are doing very well. You are teaching the pure, unadulterated doctrine of the church. Are you go? But your life is ugly and dirty and filthy and sinful. Start changing that. Did you hear me? Change it. Change your life. Change your life. Change your life. You are talking about pure doctrine. Pure doctrine. What about pure life? What about pure life? What about holiness and purity? Can you be trusted by your employers? Can you be trusted by your lectures? Ask yourself. If you knew where the question papers were and you had access to it, are you sure you will not go and look at it and even give it to some friends before the exam? Can you be trusted? Why have we divided our lives? Why have we divided our lives like that? God is calling us to one life. A life of purity in Christ Jesus. God is calling us to true discipleship. How is your relationship like? Your life with others. You say you are a true Christian and you preach the truth. But what about your relationship with the young men and the young women? You think God doesn't care? Because you come here and pray and you attend TSC and you fast and you sing and you're like, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> and you have an active concubine which you refuse to use the biblical word but you say girlfriend. What girlfriend is your concubine? <laughs> use the right Bible word. <laughs> huh? What is this? We are winning all the debates, but our life doesn't glorify God. Don't be secularized. Don't think that God is pleased with you just because you offer him some sacrifice. And once you are done with the sacrifice, the rest of your life, he doesn't care. He cares. He cares. God cares about your whole life, not just a part of it. And so every sphere of our life must be Christocentric. In the hostel with your roommates, in the hall of residence with your mates, your life must be Christocentric. Not just in the fellowship place at church. In the lecture room, your life must be Christocentric. On campus, your life must be Christocentric. Let people see Christ in you. Otherwise, my friend, you have been secularized. The forces of this world will always wage war against us to lose our Christian faith and witness or at best to become nominal Christians. We are neither cold nor warm. We just show up to add to the numbers but our lives do not depict the lives of disciples of Christ. We are not fighting a physical war. Satan is at work. And if he feels that by giving you a dual citizenship, you will be okay, he will give you a dual citizenship. There are many, many Ghanaians. If the Electoral Commission knew, they wouldn't be allowed to vote. Because they are dual citizens. Now, they wouldn't be allowed to stand for voting. They are not citizens. They are not Ghanaian American or Ghanaian Canadian. They are Satan Christ. 
And they are both. Because they've been secularized. And Satan is okay. It's okay. People like that, he doesn't bother. Because you, you are his, so it's okay. So the next time you are there alone with that girl, that beautiful princess, remember you're a Christian. Remember you're a Christian. And the fact that you marry the person doesn't give you the license to have sex with that person before marriage. You're either married or you're not married. There's no in-between. And it's a shame to talk about this among Christians. But this sexual perversion must not be mentioned among us. It's shameful and disgraceful. The spirit of arrogance must not be among us. Brilliant, scholar, but arrogant. That's not right. God is calling us to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. And Satan would have us in this camp and not bother us. We can go and worship God and say praise the Lord and do all that thing. But he knows we are his. And that must stop. Don't be deceived that you can live a divided life. You cannot. It's not acceptable to God. Our struggle as Christian students, our struggle as Christian scholars, our struggle as Christian graduates, our struggle as Christians is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, powers of this dark world, and spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. The weapons of our warfare should therefore not be carnal, but mighty in God to pull in down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Therefore, let us resolve and let us promise God that from this day onward, we will be totally committed to Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Let us make that pledge this morning that we will leave this TSC completely transformed people, people of holiness and purity, truly committed to Jesus Christ with undivided loyalty, and that we'll go back to our campuses. Wherever they are. And we will say no word. But our lives will preach the gospel of Christ. And the people will bear testimony that we are different. That when we return from Cape Coast, we have been transformed. And then when we open our mouth to speak, the, to preach the gospel, to teach about Jesus Christ, it will be powerful. Because it is backed by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Let us not come here and have fellowship and smile and eat and drink and be happy and then, have, and then go away untransformed. God is calling you. Yeah, I mean you. God is calling you. Did you hear what I said? I said God is calling you. Yes, yes. You are the one I'm talking to. God is calling you to change your life. And you over there. God wants you to have undivided loyalty to Christ, the Savior of the world. It is when we have lived such lives that God will be glorified. But we serve Him faithfully with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. That is what God is seeking from us. So let us resolve this day that going forward we will not live divided life but we will serve God once again with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. So help us God. Amen. So,
in part, well, I would just wish something that the atmosphere is so beautiful. This is being dedicated solely for all of us um, should be here for that purpose. Um, so there is more. Now we are going to ask questions. We have barely about 25 minutes for this. So as usual, keep your questions short, sweet, and snappy. So we, we can, so start out. you would take notice of the questions from this point and then you would answer, then we go to that. So let's start from my extreme right. Yes, um, the, they are coming with the microphones. Short, your name, your campus, then your question. Short, sweet, and snark. All right. So my question is? Um, your name? Simon from UG. From UG? Yeah. OK. How has um, secularism influenced the interpretation of biblical texts in contemporary Christian, Ghanaian Christianity, and how can um, traditional Ghanaian values be reconciled with modern secular influences without compromising the faith and maintaining our, our Ghanaian identities, Christian identities? All right. I hope you got it. All right. Thank you. Um, good question. Um, I am Felix from UW. Okay. Um, my question is, when um, he was talking, he made mention of the leaders at then, at their time, um, doing check-up on the members so that to know that if they are lives in the church, the same as their lives outside. But nowadays, we don't see that then when the youth go astray, um, we the youth will be blamed for it and the leaders will be left alone like that. But we know that today the social media, we can't do away with it. We use it in our daily lives. So if these things are influencing us, what are the leaders doing? An example is this conference. How often is it organized? The leaders, how are they checking up on us to make sure that these things are in place for us so that we also live the godly life? All right, thank you. Thank you. Good, good question. Leadership actions. Yes. Please hold on. He would add that small component to him, so those online can hear. So my name is Francis Parko from Amsterdam, Kumasi Campus. Okay. According to Leopold Saint Dasigor. Mm -hmm. The introduction of a literacy and education in Africa was meant to take the Africanness from us. Mm -hmm. How do we address this situation in today's Christianity without secularizing Christianity? Okay, thank you. Very good questions. Um, any more from here? Well, I'm moving to um, those facing me. Any questions from this room? Yes, we have a hand up. One behind. You go, and yes, I'll come to you. Okay, my name is Jabata Esina Manasi from UCC. Go on. My question is, at the conclusive part of his submission, he made mention that we ought to talk about it and then also expose it. And we also need to go beyond the theories and discussion and to action. So when we, we do all these things, and at the end of the day, we still have this problem among us. What next? What next? Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, okay. My name is Ebenezer from Kane West. Um, my question will have to do with, let's say, after he taught us to understand that we are not to live the double life, and let's say we see a fellow like leading those lives, how do we approach that person or that person in particular to let them know that, oh, this, 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 and what? It's what you are doing, so you are to be afraid or refrain from what you are doing. Okay, okay. thank you. How do we address individuals who are living divided lives? Um, any other from here? Okay, last one, and then. 
As far as I am going to surprise, we have been more focused on salvation. Uh, but we don't take care of uh, the lives of people. So the question is, how do we, uh, apart from this spiritual appeasement, in light of converting people to Christ? Because sometimes we compromise our values just to save people. So how do we draw the line between me saying to help somebody to know Christ and upholding my values and maybe using the person to I don't know, but what, uh, can you explain that? How do you sin to save somebody? Okay, so um, in yesterday's class, our yes. discussion, we had an example where somebody in a corporate form, where let's say the finances are not uh, in order, and you help the person to come out and help oh. the person. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, let's invite Mr. Asari to address the questions and then... Thank you very much for the questions. I would do my best to answer as I know how. And the first question was, how has secularism influenced the interpretation of scripture? Um, and then talked about Ghanaian traditional values and our Christian identity. Well, secularism affects the interpretation of scripture when scripture is viewed as a piece of literature and nothing more, nothing less. Okay, so in higher biblical criticism and um, biblical studies, some hold the theory that it's just a piece of literature. So you treat it like you treat Homer or Shakespeare, you know, or any other great literature. It's an ancient literature, great literature, but it's literature. So if you treat it that way, you take the power out of scripture, or you just think it is any other. And so then your interpretation will be skewed because you are interpret interpreting it with a view that it is just a literal matter that has been written. And so I don't think we, most of us have gotten to that level, but especially in higher education, um, you get to a level where people will see scripture as oh just written by mere men and uh, it's, we just take it as it is if that happens then certainly um, it affects the way you value scripture and it's just if you like it you take it if you don't like it you don't take it i don't think we have much of that issue among us um, so i mean i stand to be corrected but i don't think we have much of that issue among us um, the scriptures have been given by God to man or to humanity and is supposed to be able to apply in every culture and every people group. You don't have to be a Palestinian or a Jew to be a Christian. And you don't have to be an American to be a Christian. And if we understand this, then we will know how to apply Christianity to our culture. And there are things about our culture that are not against Christianity. And so we must bring our Christian influence onto the culture to reform the culture to be like Christ. But being a Christian doesn't mean rejection of your own Africanness. Putting on a tie and suit it doesn't give you any points in heaven. And so it is not how well you adapt to a foreign culture that makes you a Christian. It is how well you adapt to the scriptures. And so I would say that as far as Ghanaian cultural values are concerned and our Christian identity, values of respecting adults, values of truthfulness, values of honesty, values of helping one another. These are values that we had before we got the Bible. And the Bible has come 
And the Bible is telling us these things. So why would we reject these things? The Bible is not against truthfulness. The Bible is not against respect. So I think that perhaps it is the view that we have to make ourselves suit usually the European and American way of life and culture before we can be good Christians. And that is very far from the truth. So I don't know if I've answered the first question relating to our Africanness and the scripture and its interpretation. If not, I will try and come again. The second question relates to leaders not following up on the youth, not checking on the youth. Well, that is for the leadership to answer. Oh, unfortunately, very few of them are here. Um, it is a, a, a concern that would have to be addressed. And I think that, as we said about diagnosing a disease, helps in eradicating it. Sometimes leaders are unconscious of these things, and we must point it out to them. We must point it out to them that we are your leaders, we are going for Congress, and you just left us on our own. You know we are students, we are unemployed, we are struggling. And you could have at least paid our transportation for us, or paid our food, or paid something. You could have sent somebody to come and observe, to brief the leaders about what happened. But you didn't support us in any way. Let them know in a very respectful, nice Christian manner. Sometimes they are unaware. And they realize, that, oh yes, okay, next year they will say, all those from social and social church of Christ who will be going, Please contact us. We will pay your transportation. So you will be at K University, but you worship at Odoko Church of Christ. And they will say, okay, we will send you mobile money from there to, um, to Cape Coast or wherever it will be held next year. You know, but, but let them be aware. Don't just complain among yourselves. In a very respectful manner, let the leaders be aware. Let's draw the attention because it is important that they support they support this ministry because that is the future of the church. So let's bring that to the attention. However, let me add that we also have a responsibility to be there for one another, to support one another. It is very important. When Mr. Samuel Ayim and a few others started this university thing, we had to travel to campuses and there was no support from the church leadership. It was new in those days. Now they cannot, you know, uh, excuse themselves. But in those days it was very new. So we had to mobilize our own resources to travel from campus to campus to mobilize students. We started a newsletter, the a newspaper, the reminder, which reported on what was happening on all the campuses and what was happening among the youth. It was printed like the daily graphic. You know, and it was circulated. We couldn't sustain it, but for three, four years or so, we were able to do that. And the resources didn't come from any church. It came from among the students. And so it's important that we also support one another. We support one another, we encourage one another. But let's draw the attention of leadership to some of these lapses. Introduction of literacy into Africa is to take away our Africanism from us. And how can we, I guess, your Africanized Christianity? I don't know if that is what the quest, the import of, of the question. Well, as I said, the original intention of education was not to make Africans intellectuals, was not to make Africans think for themselves. It was to make Africans fill rules that Europeans needed filled. Middle level rules of administrators, and helpers in government ministries and uh, people helping in mobilization of resources, people being the liaison between the Europeans and the Africans. So that was what it was about. But it's been centuries. It's been centuries. So it now behoves on the educated, if the narrative hasn't changed, to change the narrative. It behoves on us. So if you hold on to something that you know is wrong, then you've not been properly educated. Because a properly educated person should be able to be bold and stand and say that this is wrong. 
And we shouldn't just be following things blindly. That's what the purpose of education is. It's to enlighten you, to open your eyes, to see possibilities, to help you to do research on your own. So you shouldn't be the carrier of secondhand information. Somebody said this, so you are parroting it all over the place. Have you checked yourself to see if that is the truth? Have you checked yourself to see what, if that is the truth? And do you have the courage to point it out that this is not the truth? So it is important that if those who brought literacy to us brought it with a different mindset, now check UCC, check KNUST, check University of Ghana, check um, all the other universities. How many foreign lecturers do we have? We are all Ghanaian lecturers. So why hasn't things changed? It's not Ghanaians teaching Ghanaians. So where's the problem? Why are we still blaming the Europeans 300 years after the fact? 60 years after independence, we are still blaming the Europeans? The fact is that Christianity is for the whole world. And so it is for us to adapt our culture to the Christian values as shown in, in the scriptures. And if a culture is not against what the scriptures teach, then what is our problem with it? So it, it, it calls for hard work. It just doesn't happen verbally. It calls for hard work. And it calls for some bold steps to make sure that whatever is African, which is good and is not against scripture, we proudly project. We proudly project. In addressing, in what we eat, in how we talk, in how we communicate, all that. We can project that as African Christians. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is why you've had this education. Don't waste that, this education. As educated people, ask yourself, what can you do to change the African narrative? whilst being truthful to scripture. It behoves on all of us. It's a collective responsibility. And if nobody will do it, start it. And it will get somewhere. Someone asked the question about if we try all the actions we are to try and we still see secularism in our midst, what should we do? I have good news for you. Secularism is not going anywhere. This is not been to, done it, accomplish. No, it's not like that. It's not the one time to know we've done it. From uh, TSC 2024, we've banished secularism. Praise the Lord. It doesn't work like that. It's an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing struggle. And perhaps an uphill task. Because the influences are still coming from outside and from within. From outside and from within. Now listen to our music. The music that the youth are listening to. When we were young, we were listening to some uh, Jamaicans who were singing raga and all those things. Now it's from within. It's not even foreign. It's from within. And it's not going to stop. The entertainment industry is not going to stop. So we must understand that this is not a one-time thing. It's not a conference matter. It's a lifelong matter. So it will not happen that, oh, secularism has been eliminated among us. No. We must constantly remember we are Christians. We must constantly support one another. We must constantly en en encourage and engage one another. And that will lead me to the question of... Um, how do we approach someone who is living a, uh, a divided life? How do we approach people who are living divided lives? Love cares. Love confronts. If you truly love somebody and that person is going astray, you should be the first person to go to the person. Unless you don't love the person. You should not be afraid to correct somebody. When you know the person is going to destroy himself or herself. So, it comes back to the issue of do we truly love people? Do we truly love people? And if you truly love somebody and that person is going to danger, won't you tell the person, 
Won't you tell the person? Won't you stop the person? Love confronts. When Nathan, uh, David sinned, Nathan went to him and he confronted him. Paul says that he confronted Peter. Can you imagine someone who walked with Jesus? Who spoke, preached the first sermon? You, Paul, you came yesterday. Eh? You, have, you have, have, Where were you? When Jesus was walking on water, did you see? And he said, no, no, but I confronted Peter because at the point he was behaving like a hypocrite. Hey, Peter, I thought hypocrisy was for only me. Oh. Peter, so, Peter too. And he was confronted. And Paul didn't even leave it there. He also wrote it for us to read. <laughs> ah, Paul, pa. It's love. Please, we should never shy away from confronting people. Mr. Ayimbe, perhaps he has forgotten. Those who started the Legon Church of Christ or University of Ghana Church of Christ, we had one man among us who became a judge, brilliant lawyer. He was posted somewhere where he was like the, the, the supreme person there. It was a small, not a very big city, you know. So the judge was powerful. Everybody was afraid of the judge. And later we heard that uh, he had taken to drinking and to certain lifestyles and, and everybody was afraid. And he went to church, but hey, the judge, when he comes to church, every, you know, because in that town he was a big man. We mobilized ourselves. We went there. We, because to us, he was one of us. You, you understand? He was one of us. To some people, he was uh, my lordship. Uh, your, to us, he was just I nearly mentioned his name, you know. <laughs> yeah, he was one of us. So we went to him as friends and we told him, this will destroy you. You shouldn't do that. You know. And we, we confronted him with, with love. Because for us to travel from Accra to that place, it cost us. And he realized that if we didn't love him, we wouldn't have bothered to go there. So please, never fail to confront someone you love if the person is fallen by the side. Your duty is to confront with love and tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. Even if they don't listen to you, keep telling them. And don't give up on people because God never gave up on you. The last question, or would there be more questions or this would be? Oh, okay, let me quickly do this. That the Church of Christ was focused on salvation. And um, can somebody remind that? You, know, that you say we focus on salvation and something else. And we, we don't... We sacrifice some, some. Well, we sacrifice to, yes, 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 to, um, yeah, sometimes we sin. Is that the one you talked about? We sin to save people. My friend, nobody can sin to save anyone. In the first place, you, you cannot save anyone. Uh, you are not the savior. You can't save anyone. So you dare not sin to save anybody. Um, that is not acceptable. Um, our duty is to preach the gospel, convert souls, and keep teaching them. So it never ends. Teach, baptize, teach. That's what Matthew 28 says. Sometimes I want to teach, 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 and baptize. That's not what Jesus said. Teach, baptize, teach. Please, you cannot compromise your faith because you are saving somebody. It doesn't work that way. That is living a divided life. That is not pleasing to God. Thank you. Let's take the next batch of questions from this room. Uh, yes, Ima. Okay, and Johannes. And Young lady. Okay, okay. Take it. Um, I'm Alexander from Alexander from K University. All right, so concerning the persecutions and the building of faith, um, I wanted to know, is it unlike the early Christians and the apostles, the kind of persecution that they went through? 
during their time. If we're not in at all, Paul did state an example of the persecution that he went through in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, in our time now, those kind of persecutions, most of us don't face them. Of course, there are some countries that they are being killed for, you know, worshipping. Um, but most of us here, all of us here, don't go through such kind of sufferings and persecutions. So if you can help us by highlighting some forms of persecutions we go through today as Christians to be able to help in building our faith. And also some things that the world have kind of like covered to make it a formality or normality for us so that they can be shown out there and we can know how to also go about it in building our faith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sebastian. My name is Johannes. I'm affiliated to the Church of Christ, University of Ghana. Thank you for drawing attention to spirituality and especially on the faith of the church doctrine and the fact that there is a focus on some where we don't look at the Christian life. But specifically, um, I want to ask how can the church effectively engage with secular ideas and still promote positive interactions? with individuals who hold different beliefs. I think if you share the light on that, it will help a lot of us, especially those of us who focus on some aspects and with the other. My second question is, what role do you see Christians playing in shaping a secular society while maintaining their faith and values? And I'll be glad to answer this based on the ongoing discussion on LGBT on the global and national front. Thank you. Well, we have news for you. Thank you. Um, that's the road my screen left. Anybody from here? Any question from here? Okay. Yes. I would always take the female over the male. All right. Yes. <laughs> Hold on. Let's. Uh, this is fair discrimination. Yeah. Okay, so um, at the latter part of the discussion, okay, at the latter part, he was talking about as Christians, like sometimes we follow more doctrines as per like the other ones. So I've realized that most uh, most of us, as we call ourselves Christians, we follow doctrines or religion more than being Christians, like following Christ. And so as a church, you see, and also as people of God, what are the things we can do as a church or among ourselves to help us to live like a Christian life more than um, following doctrines and being more religious, even though in the church they teach us about certain doctrines, it helps us, but it seems that we focus more on the doctrines more than living a Christian life. So that's why most of the times we debate with our other people from different fellowship, you see, debating and other stuff. So what are we doing as church to help ourselves and also among ourselves, what are we doing to help ourselves? And I think we should live a life of Christ, even though we can't be hundred percent, but we should leave some certain, a certain um, percentage that when people see and approach us, they will notice that we are Christian, not that we are from this church or we are from this church. Thank you. Okay. Um. Yes, she was passionate about the question. Yeah. Yes, let's hear it. Thank you. I'm Victor Galetsi from UAW, and I want to know: Is there some career opportunities that are not well pursued by Christians because of voted forces of secularization. Uh, thinking about um, a Christian being CEO of an alcoholic beverage company, or a Christian, or a Christian being a secular musician, what would such a person draw the line between his career and the, uh, his career and his Christian life? His Christian All right, thank you. Uh, before Mr. Asari comes, um, please permit me to add my voice to the question from the gentleman from here in terms of um, what leadership is doing in relation to the story he shared. Uh, I, all of you know that I, I, I advocate for young people, but that question has a side we must not lose sight of. I am presuming that at their time they were open to such interventions. The question is, many of you think that you are independent. 
and that you don't need anybody's intervention. Wouldn't you think that as, as intrusion, that what does church leaders have to do with your private life? Wouldn't you ask that question? So you must begin to position yourself in such a way that the leaders would find it prudent and feel okay to help you when the need arises. The way most of you are going, it is not good at all. So I wanted to bring that. Often we, we look to the older generation. Yes, they have their role to play, but the way we are behaving today is what is leading them to stand aloof from our lives. Most of us think we, are, we can be masters of our own ships. So, so I wanted to bring that up as well. Thank you. I would attempt uh, these last six questions as well. The first one was about can Christians be leaders in our society without uh, being influenced by secularization? And my answer is yes. If we cannot, then why are we Christians? Why did Christ call us? To influence the world. And if you can influence the world through leadership, why can't you do that? It is difficult. But so is any other thing. So if we run away from the fact that it is difficult, we don't solve the problem. God is looking for his people in leadership. And so it is possible. It is difficult, but it is possible. And such people need the encouragement, the encouragement of the body of Christ. But if we don't do that, look, 20 years from now, we'll be discussing the same issue. We complain about corrupt politicians, but nobody wants to go into politics. So how do we change it? We should rather applaud those who have ventured in there and support them. And support them. So it is possible to do it. And we need more young people in leadership of our communities and our societies. Our second question about persecution and the faith that we don't face persecution as it was during the Bible times. And so, what kinds of persecution do we go through today? I think in my presentation I mentioned that what we are going through, excuse my language, is nothing compared to what they went through. Because for them, it was a matter of life and death. For us, it's a matter of honor and dishonor. You have your life. It's just that some people would say things about you. You understand? Some people will ridicule you. Some people will look down on you. They will not cut your hand off. But they will just look spitefully upon you. And you think that is a big challenge compared to people who are losing their lives? So yes, we do go through persecution. But the way I see it, in this country of ours, where our constitution guarantees freedom of association, freedom of movement, and freedom of speech, I don't think that we can ever go through any persecution that is so difficult, so unbearable for us. But it's all a matter of our perception and how we, we are looking for favor. We want people to see us in a certain light. And so if people cannot see us in that light, we feel persecuted. You see, but it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so. So please, we do face persecution. Young people do face persecution. But in my opinion, and I stand to be corrected, it is a matter of public opinion, peer acceptance, you know, popularity, and you know, getting favors, getting doors open for them. I mean, if you, you are looking for a job, and somebody says, okay, I will give you the job if you compromise your Christian faith. And then you feel, I have been unemployed for years. Therefore, this is a great temptation. I have to. You've been unemployed, but you eat every day. Are you comparing with some people who were put in prison? Beaten up daily for three years, and you living with your parents for three years? So, yes, we all face these persecutions, these temptations, and all that. 
But if it means giving up a job for the sake of Christ, I don't think you've sacrificed more than those in the Bible times. So I hope I've helped in answering the question. Um, the third question was about how the church can effectively engage the secular world and still hold on to our values. Once again, as I have said, we must understand that our Christian calling is not for us to form a society of hermits, a society of people secluded from the world. That's not what Christ called us into. Christ called us to engage the world and to change the world. So we certainly can engage the world, but we must know where we stand. If you are not standing well, how do you engage the world? So we must know who we are and where we stand. Then we can engage the world. Once the world knows our position and they know they cannot change us, they will respect our position. But if we change our position to suit the world, then they know how to manipulate us. But if we cannot engage the world, then we are failed as disciples of Christ. If we cannot engage the world, constructively and win the world for Christ then we are failed as disciples of Christ Christ is calling us to engage the world and we certainly can do it even though it is difficult what do we see as uh, Christians are play, playing our role in the secular world especially the question was related to, to the LGBT I believe that most people if not all people, know the position of Christians as far as this thing is concerned, this LGBT and other social vices are concerned. Most people know the position of Christians. And so to articulate a Christian position is not strange. Most people know that's what Christians believe in. And they are saying, allow us who don't believe like you to do whatever we want to do. And I believe what the law is saying is that we are not going to come to your bedroom and put a CCTV camera in your bedroom. But we are a community. We are a society. And so we have to protect the entire society. Especially the young ones. And so that is my understanding. It is a very simplified one. But as far as I am concerned, if a matter of national interest comes up and Christians cannot articulate their position, then they have failed. And so we have to ask ourselves, how engaged are we in the national conversation? The fact that we are Christians doesn't mean that whatever they do, we don't care. We, we are caring, we, all we care about is heaven. Well, whatever laws they do affect us, affect our children, affect our families, affect everything else we do. And more importantly, affect our faith. So we must also bring our faith to the table. And we can argue constructively on our faith. The Christian faith is, is not afraid to debate our Christian faith. From time immemorial, Christians have always defended their faith. And it has been proven that Christianity is better for society. It's not just good, it's better for society. So it is for us to know how to articulate our position and articulate it well. And if you don't know how to do it, find people who know how to do it. So they can, you can support them to do it. Sometimes you hear people talking about things they are ignorant about. And you hear their argument, and the arguments are porous. They hold no substance. But the person is sweating over an argument that holds nothing. Why don't you humble yourself and say, this one I don't know. But I know somebody who can speak to this matter. And let the people deal with it. But sometimes everybody wants to be an apologist. Everybody wants to be a scholar. Everybody wants to be this. It doesn't help. We all have our strengths. Let's support those who are knowledgeable in certain areas to speak to it. That is what I would say. But definitely we have to engage the world. Our sister asks about following doctrine, religion, more than following Christ. Or following certain doctrines more than following Christ. And I believe she's, she's right on that. You see, the sad thing is that we have failed to appreciate what doctrine is. And as I've said, righteousness, holiness, purity, kindness, that, these are Christian doctrines. 
So when you go online and you insult somebody as a Christian, are you being kind? Are you being kind? The fact that somebody disagrees with you doesn't make the person an evil person. And feels that, oh, so long as you disagree with me, I can insult you. That is not Christ-like. So let's not define doctrine to be only one set. Doctrine is broad. It's very broad. And what is being advocated is that we must hold on to the whole doctrine of Christ. Not to some, but the whole doctrine of Christ. So as you are busy debating theoretical issues, also debate practical issues of life. That's what we are saying. Do both. But don't take one end and leave the other end. Let's do both. Certainly, we are called to be disciples of Christ. And when you are a disciple of Christ, it's not for you to be propagating it that you are a disciple of Christ. The world will see it. The world will see it. So please, let us understand that Christ has called us to be like him. That's what he has called us to do. And when we are like him, our words carry even more power. That when we are not with him, we are just preaching and preaching and preaching, and people look at your life, and your life doesn't look like Christ. Your life. I believe it was St. Augustine, perhaps Professor will help me, who said that, by all means, preach the gospel. And if possible, use words. Uh, do you understand that? By all means, no matter what, preach the gospel. If necessary, or something, that's what he said. If necessary, use words. So what he's saying is that the gospel must be preached with your life. Your life must be the first one to preach your gospel. You know what Paul said? That you are letters, you are epistles, people are reading. That is your life. Then if, possible, if necessary, you can use words also. But your life is the first one, the first gospel you preach. So let us not be so enchanted about the doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. You ask yourself, what is the doctrine? And are we living the doctrine? Are we living the doctrine? That's what we should do. Should we follow all career opportunities? Certainly not. The fact that something is lucrative doesn't mean that you should do it. It must be based on that which would give you the ultimate price. The ultimate price. Heaven. And so if you are going into a career path that you know is against your Christian principle, it's not something for a preacher to tell you. It is something for you to know. This one is not something that you go and seek advice. No, you should know. If you have been a Christian, unless you are a new convert, you should know that this is against my faith. I will not go there. And in any case, who told you that you are going to do what you learned in school? Who told you that? Mr. Hessian introduced me. My first degree is in business administration. Banking and finance. I belong to the third group of people trained to be bankers in this country. The third group. And when we finished, banks were looking for us. I ended up doing sign language, starting deaf ministry. <laughs> Sometimes people will go to my mother and say, Obama, your son, is he correct up here? How can you go to university school of administration, banking and finance? And banks are looking for you to this day, they are the highest paying employers. And then you go and be doing this sign language. When I was going to marry some people to advise my wife, if you marry him, all your children will be deaf, so don't marry me. Oh, oh yes, it happened. <laughs> university, I remember one day that this guy actually go to university. Ah, and he's doing the sign language business thing, working with the deaf and starting deaf ministries. Years later, the church wanted to start a children's home. They needed an administrator. Then the elder brother, that boy, that young man working about to train his sons, he has a degree from Legon. Go and call him so they can say, we hear you went to Legon to do administration. Say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, the elder said, we want you to go around the orphanage. That's how I go to the village of hope. 
And the knowledge that I used, I learned in the university, is what I used to run Village of Hope. And look at me, now I'm into ministry and to social work. I never learned social work. I never learned education. I've established four schools. But I don't have a B.Ed. I don't even have a postgraduate degree in uh, education. A postgraduate, what do they call it? Diploma. Postgraduate diploma. Me, me, I don't have it. But I've established four schools. And I'm employing people with master's degrees. So this issue of career, don't think that if I don't do this, that is the end of the world. Look at Mr. Ayim sitting there. He is a lawyer. Ask him how many cases he has won in court. He said. <laughs> I'm not saying it behind him, I'm saying it in front of him. <laughs> a whole lawyer. You understand? He's senior to most of the lawyers you know. You know Professor Apejetia, Koja Apejetia, the Faculty of Law, Lego. Mr. Yim is a senior. Ask him how many cases he has won. He ended up being a banker. Okay? But he used the law in banking. And today he's into leadership. So please, whatever your career, you must use it to glorify God. Whatever your career, use it to glorify God. And be someone that God can depend on. Don't let God regret that you have been educated. Thank you. Please indulge me, indulge me. I, um, I want to add my voice to two issues. And then uh, how can Christians successfully engage culture? Um, it's, it's one question we are struggling with, but this would be my suggestion. I think in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus um, described the disciples as salt and light. You see, salt is not afraid of any soup it enters, right? <laughs> and light is not afraid of any environment that is dark. Because by virtue of its content, it is able to affect whichever environment. The challenge is not whether we can go there or not. The challenge is what are you going with? Are you salt enough? Are we light enough? That is our challenge. We claim to be Christians, but sometimes it is just by mouth. Inwardly, we are whole. We are empty. And so we go in there and we are rather transformed. Instead of us, transformed. So brothers and sisters, um, as you hear me talk about, the only cure to death is resurrection. And I believe the only cure to set you, move on to us, is, is spirituality. That is the only cure. That is the only way we can overcome it. It is here with us. But our response should not be panic. It should be deepening ourselves in the life of Christ. That's all.